So welcome to the second lecture of this week. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, the stress tensor, which is a very special operator in conformal field theory. Now, to get at the stress tensor, to get at the stress tensor in, in, a, in an efficient way, I'd like to get at, get at it through the notion of uh, quantum field theory and curve space. So up to this point, we've been talking about uh, conformal field theory in a flat space. And I'd like to tell you today a little bit about how to broaden that perspective and to think about these field theories in the context of a space that might be curved, like a sphere or a hyperbola. All right, so let's get started. So again, the goal today, I want to show you that the stress tensor, and I'll use the symbol T with two superscripts, uh, two subscripts, sorry, mu and nu, this is the stress tensor, is classically traceless in conformal field theory. So that's the goal. And as I was saying just uh, in, in my introductory uh, introductory speech, an, an efficient way to get at this result is from curve space. Because in curve space, a, a way of defining the stress tensor is the response of the system to a change in the metric, a change in the way space is curved. We, we say t mu nu is sourced, the, t mu nu the operator is sourced by the metric, for which I'll use the symbol g mu nu. Okay, so that's, we'll get to that. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about uh, quantum field theory and curved space. And let's do it by example. So let's consider a massless scalar field. Our old friend from relativistic quantum field theory, perhaps the simplest quantum field theory, and we'll even start in flat space. So we have an action, we have a conventional factor of a half, an integral over our flat space, d dx, and then the so-called kinetic term uh, for this field, which is uh, d mu phi uh, contracted with itself. And as I hope you've seen from this, the equations in motion uh, show you that the field phi will satisfy the, the massless Klein-Gordon equation, box phi equals zero. Anyway, the indices here in this expression are raised and lowered with the Minkowski tensor, eta mu nu. And now there's a very pedestrian way uh, to lift this to curve space. We, we do the following. Well, we turn the page. In curve space, we're basically, we're going to write basically exactly, almost exactly the same thing. We have an S, we have a factor of a half, we have an integral over curve space. I'm going to leave a space to put something in here in a minute. And then I have d mu phi, d mu phi, where now the indices are raised and lowered with not the Minkowski tensor, but with the metric, the full curve space metric of space time. And so that second part uh, winds up being, um, as I say, diffeomorphism invariant. But the first part isn't quite there yet. Uh, it doesn't transform the, quite the right way uh, when we do uh, when we when we change the variables of the integration. We want to be able to absorb the Jacobian factor under changes of variables, and so we need to put a factor of the determinant of the metric with a conventional factor of minus one there, because we have a time. So that time. That minus one absorbs the minus one in the determinant, so we can take the square root of a, of a, of a, of a positive quantity. This is a pedestrian way of um, lifting basically almost any action to curve space. Instead of, uh, instead of contracting uh, using the Minkowski tensor, we contract using the full metric of space-time. And instead of just integrating over space, we have this uh, volume element, uh, which includes the determinant of the metric, so that under changes a variable, it, it absorbs that Jacobian factor. Now this naive approach misses some things that can be quite important. And, and there's an, an example I'll, I'll, I'll assign a little bit later where, where you'll see that. It misses terms which vanish in flat space. So for example, maybe you have the Ricci scalar curvature. If you have the Ricci scalar curvature, you might be able to have a term in the action that's say r phi squared. That would show up in curve space, but in flat space it wouldn't be there. And actually, for the scalar field, that term is, is quite important. Okay, now, what is conformal symmetry in curved space? So, conformal symmetry in curved space, it's the set of coordinate transformations, or as we say in a fancy, somewhat fancy array, diffeomorphisms, but all we mean are coordinate transformations. X goes to some new prime, which is a function of the old coordinates, which leave the metric invariant up to scaling. And now I'm going to write something down, which is almost the same thing we wrote down to define the conformal group in flat space. So let's do that. So instead of sending the Minkowski tensor to a new tensor, we'll send the full metric 
to a new metric. And the, and the rule for these change of coordinates is we have to contract uh, with these Jacobian factors, dx alpha, dx prime mu, dx beta, dx prime nu, g alpha beta. And for this to be a conformal transformation, we have to be able to write this as a local function of space-time times the original metric, g mu nu. So again, that's exactly the same thing we wrote before, but now instead of the metric, sorry, instead of the Minkowski tensor, we have the metric. Now these changes of coordinates, or, or diffeomorphisms, are trivially a symmetry once we uh, lift our flat space action to curve space in this particular way. We've lifted the action in a way to guarantee that. We have this, this determinant of the metric, which absorbs the, 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 volume, uh, the volume factor in, in the integral. And all of those metric contractions are done in a way that it, you have a scalar quantity, which, which doesn't respond to diffeomorphisms. So the non-trivial bit that's left over is the, is the rescaling that's sending g mu nu to some local function of g mu nu. This is so-called vial symmetry or vial scaling. Um, that's the non-trivial bit that these uh, theories in curve space must have so that when you push them back down to the flat space case, you get a conformal field theory. So if they have vial symmetry in the curve space case, then classically at least they should have uh, conformal symmetry in this flat space context that we've been discussing up to now. Let, let me give you an example. This is a, quite an important example. I, I'm not going to work out the details. I'll leave it to you. It's the free scalar field. So here's my determinant of the metric. Here's the kinetic term. And this isn't quite vial invariant. I need to add something else to it. I need to add this term that I mentioned you can't see from the flat space case because the curvature is, 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 is zero for flat space. Now, when you choose C to be a very particular value, it depends on the space-time dimension, d minus two over four d minus one, this is, this example is vial invariant. So I'm going to leave that to you as an exercise. So undershifting the metric, and you also have to shift the field. Uh, you know, phi has to go to um, omega to the delta over 2 times phi in the same way we discussed for primary fields. But under this simultaneous shift, um, the whole action is invariant. So for a more precise statement of that example, you should see the class notes, uh, but I leave, leave it to you to, to verify. Okay, so that's, that's my background on how you lift uh, conformal field theories in flat space to conformal field theories in curved space. Obviously, there's much more to say here, um, but let's not. Let's just move on and go to what we want to say, uh, which is about the stress tensor. So the usual way to introduce it is through Noether's theorem. It's the conserved current associated with space-time translations. I don't want to use this approach. There's so many resources for this. Uh, you can look it up on Wikipedia. I'm pretty sure I saw it as a final exam question for the quantum field theory module last term. Um, but at any rate, if you use Noether's theorem, there's a, a way to crank this machine out and uh, out comes the stress tensor at the end of the day. And so you get this object which has these indices. Let's write it with upper indices uh, just to be slightly perverse from what we did before. The zero, zero component or the time, time component is usually identified with the energy density. So if you integrate that up, you get a conserved energy, you get the Hamiltonian. The I, I components uh, you can think of as a pressure. And then the zero I components, you can think of those as momentum densities or also energy currents. It's up to you. But if you integrate them up, they'll give you the spatial momenta, which are also conserved quantities in a translationally invariant context. So that, that's the usual way of, of introducing it. And now what we want to do is give you an alternate presentation as the response of the theory to changes in an external metric. So if I vary the action with respect to the metric in this curved space-time approach, what I get inside the integral, this is another way of getting at that same quantity, at getting at the stress tensor. So Noether's theorem is a bit laborious to go through in detail. Uh, so here I want to use um, uh, this approach because it, I, I can get at the, the consequences of the symmetries a little bit more directly. So for example, if we think about diffeomorphisms or changes of coordinates, so x mu goes to x prime, mu is x of mu, and let's make them infinitesimal, okay? So when I want a minus here so that I can have plus signs a little bit later on. 
So I have some arbitrary small function epsilon mu of x, just like we had for the conformal transformations. I'm going to shift my coordinate system in this way. I'll leave it to you to work out that the metric uh, then changes uh, by partial mu epsilon nu plus partial nu epsilon mu. So before these were just ordinary partial derivatives, but in the curve space context, uh, they become covariant derivatives. It's, it's not a big deal. Um, it, Morally, it's just the same thing we wrote before. And now what I want to do is I want to plug in and integrate by parts. And what do I learn? I learn that partial mu t mu nu, well, actually covariant uh, derivative of mu uh, of the stress tensor, this must vanish. Since epsilon is arbitrary, it's some arbitrary change of coordinates, and this action must vanish in general if it's going to be a symmetry, uh, then after integrating by parts, I, I see that the divergence of the stress tensor must vanish. And then from this, um, and this is usually the, the first step, and then from this there's a way to, to convince yourself that E, the energy and momenta are conserved using, say, Stokes' theorem. So I'm pretty sure if you've had a quantum field theory uh, module, you've seen this, uh, maybe ad nauseum. So again, I don't want to belabor it too much. I want to get to the result very quickly just to remind you and move on to the new result, which is very, very special to, to, uh, to conformal field theories. Vial symmetry. Now with vial symmetry, the change in the metric is what? It's just some little local function, we'll call it lambda of x, g mu nu. And now I plug this into delta, into my, my change in the action. The change in the action has to vanish if this is a symmetry. And so from this I learn what? I learn that the trace of the stress tensor must vanish. And this is a result we're thinking about. Uh, this is, is a special to conformal field theories. It's a special feature of conformal field theories um, that the trace of the stress tensor in these theories must vanish. So this treatment was all classical and, and really, you know, these are quantum field theories. There's a path integral. And so just because you have a classical symmetry doesn't mean that the symmetry is really there. It can be violated by quantum effects. The measure in the path integral uh, may not respect that symmetry. If you do loop calculations in the path integral and Feynman diagrams, you may find that, it, that it's not true. So in that context, if I think about the expectation value of the stress, trace of the stress tensor, this is true classically, but it, it's often violated by quantum effects. Uh, and this is the subject of trace anomalies, which is a popular subject in modern, uh, modern theoretical physics research. Uh, something I've written a number of uh, uh, papers on myself, in fact. Let me give you a little teaser of uh, what you might learn if you, if you go down this path further and learn more about trace anomalies. So in 2D CFT, two-dimensional conformal field theories, there's a famous result that the trace of the stress tensor is equal to, I think it's conventionally normalized, there's a constant C and people often put a factor of 24 over pi because they like to relate it to other quantities where it has a more natural normalization, like the two-point function of the stress tensor. But at any rate, here I think it shows up as c over 24 pi, and then all, this r is again the Ricci scalar curvature. So in flat space, this trace will vanish, but if you put your conformal field theory on a sphere where the Ricci scalar curvature is some constant, you'll find that the trace of the stress tensor uh, is this has this constant value. Now what's what's interesting about this quantity C that shows up, there's a there's a theorem that was proven by Zamologikov in the 80s, this is the Zamologikov C theorem, that in, if you have an RG flow between CFT fixed points, so remember in RG you typically have a very high energy fixed point where the theory stops flowing and a, a low energy fixed point where the theory stops flowing and then in, in intermediate energies of course the, the rules depend on scale, but you have these fixed points at high and low energy. So you have an RG flow between these CFT fixed points, C must decrease. So that puts a very interesting order on the space of conformal field theories in two dimensions. And in fact, there are generalizations of this to three and four dimensions and conjectures that it might even hold in higher dimension as well. So that's one of the things that gets us excited, uh, us theorists who are interested in conformal field theories. All right, that concludes uh, my second lecture uh, of the week. Uh, next time, Tune back and we'll discuss uh, correlation functions in conformal field theory and how the constraints of conformal symmetry affect the structure of those correlation functions. In fact, largely fix them up to a few constants in certain cases.